Hey everyone, Victor is here, your guide to all things organic chemistry, and in this video I want to talk about the two main methods how we are going to make epoxides. First, it is the epoxidation of alkenes with peroxy acids, and second is going to be the intramolecular cyclization of halohydrines. So grab your cup of coffee and notebook to work through the examples with me, hit that like button for good luck on the test, and let's get started. We'll start by looking at the epoxidation of alkenes. Epoxidation of alkenes is a fairly typical reaction of alkenes that you've already seen in your course. It is also sometimes referred to as the Prilegeieff oxidation or Prilegeieff reaction. But on an off chance that you didn't see this reaction or maybe you don't remember it, let's look at its mechanism real quick. The most common epoxidation agent that you're going to see in your course is likely going to be the MCPBA, which stands for metachloroperbenzoic acid, however, any other peroxy acid will work just fine. So, for instance, you might also encounter a peroxyacetic acid or another reagent that we abbreviate is MMPP. For our purposes, those peroxy acids are completely interchangeable. So, for instance, if I take one methylcyclohexene and then I treat that with MCPBA, I am going to end up with the corresponding epoxide plus the enantiomer in this particular case. Mechanistically speaking, this entire reaction is a concerted process that makes an epoxide in one mechanistic step. There are two ways how we show this mechanism. One way is going to use four arrows, and another method is going to use five arrows. Typically, instructors and textbooks are going to prefer one or the other, so make sure you double check with the, uh, your instructor or textbook which one you're using in your course. They both are correct for our purposes, so it is not like one is strictly better than the other one, it is not. If you want to learn more details of this mechanism or work through more practice problems, I'll leave all the links in the description below uh, for all those tutorials. I do want to point out, however, that this reaction is stereospecific. So you gotta pay attention to how you draw your product based on the starting material and how the starting material looks like. So, for instance, if I take the e pent 2 in and treat that with peroxy acid, I'm going to end up with a different product than if I were to do the same reaction but with the z pent 2 in And while we are talking about the stereochemistry of the epoxidation reaction, it might be a very good idea to also quickly go over how to draw those pesky epoxides. If, for instance, I took E1-phenylprop1-in and then I treat that with peroxy acid, like for instance MCPBA, I'm going to get the corresponding epoxide. However, since we normally zigzag our bond line structures, drawing this compound will be somewhat awkward keeping our skeleton intact. You might see your instructor and your textbook doing a slightly different approach to these drawings. Often, we are going to keep the epoxide in the plane of paper while uh, we are going to arrange the rest of the molecule around it. And let me illustrate that with an example. I'll take the same starting material that I have on top of this page and I will rotate it in space a little bit. I'm kind of going to tilt it in space in such a way that the uh, phenyl and the hydrogen are going to be looking at me, while the hydrogen and CH3 on the other side of the molecule are going to be looking away. Now, if I bring my peroxy acid from the top face of this molecule, then in this case I'm going to end up with the epoxide kind of looking up in the plane of paper, while the rest of the groups are still looking in the same relative directions where they used to look before the reaction, so the phenyl is still looking at me, the CH3 is still looking away from me. Likewise, if I were to do this attack from the bottom face of the molecule, then in this case I will end up with the epoxide looking down, but I still have uh, the epoxide in the plane of paper, while the rest of the groups are looking in the corresponding direction. This way you are pointing the rest of the molecule in different directions, rather than trying to poke the epoxide ring towards you or away from you. Drawing the epoxide on dashes and wedges while zigzagging your molecule is not you know, necessarily incorrect, but it is awkward and can potentially be ambiguous, so be very careful with how you draw those molecules. If it is hard to imagine these molecules in 3D, you might want to play with your molecular model kit and build those molecules. This way you can rotate them in space and see how the 
two-dimensional drawing corresponds to the actual molecule in three dimensions. Now, moving on to the next common epoxidation technique, we can cause an intramolecular SN2 reaction in vicinal halohydrins. So, for instance, if I took the cyclohexene and then I treat that cyclohexene first with bromine and excess of water, then in this case I would end up with the corresponding halohydrin. Then, if I took this molecule and reacted it with some sort of a base that is strong enough to be able to deprotonate our OH, maybe like a hydroxide or an amide or uh, maybe even H- or something like that. So in this case, I'm going to end up with the alcoholate and that alcoholate is going to undergo the intramolecular SN2 reaction, essentially closing the epoxide ring. If you need a reminder of how this reaction works, either the halohydrate information or the SN2 reaction, I will have uh, all the links in the description below as well, and I do have a, a dedicated video to the halohydrin information via the hydroxyhalogenation reaction of alkenes. Now, looking at this reaction, you might have a reasonable doubt about how efficient it is, since three-membered rings are typically quite unstable. True, a three-membered ring is very strained, and tends to burst open at the first opportunity. But in this case, due to the fact that the electro Electrophilic position and the nucleophilic positions in this molecule are so close to each other, the reaction still proceeds comparatively smoothly, giving you the epoxide despite how strained it might be. So, when you're working with your uh, functional group transformations, you can choose whichever method you like. Are those methods completely interchangeable? No, they are actually not. However, most instructors and textbooks within the scope of a regular sophomore organic course are not going to discuss the differences and the details of those reactions and why they might consider one over the other one. So, for the vast majority of organic chemistry students, these reactions are going to be interchangeable. So, you can always double check with your instructor if there is anything that you need to know about one of those reactions versus the other reaction, uh, and in which case you might want to use one uh, versus the other one, but I doubt you will need that within the scope of your course. Of course, if you guys want me to make a video and explain why we would want to use one method versus the other one, let me know in the comments below and I will definitely talk more about that. Well, that's all I have on the epoxide formation for today. Let me know which topic I should tackle next in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and especially thank you all Organic Chemistry Tutor members for your support and constant encouragement. You guys rock! If you learned something new today, hit the like button to show me that and to promote this video and help more students uh, see that. Leave me your questions and feedback in the comments below. Subscribe to the channel for daily organic chemistry updates. Watch this video next for more cool organic chemistry stuff, and I will see you tomorrow!